In what way? You know you're live, right? <laughs> oops, oops. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for coming tonight. My name is Sean Camacho. Uh, your microphone is not good. I'm going to find some batteries for this microphone at some point. But in the meantime, my name is Sean Camacho. I am captain of HD6B. I want to welcome you to, welcome you to our meeting tonight and say thank you. First of all, because the weather is gorgeous outside, and you're sharing some of that evening twilight with us, and we really appreciate it. But it's for a worthy cause, and you're going to get some great information tonight. So as I look around the room, I want to recognize some candidates. Uh, Shannon Hoffman, who we'll be hearing from later. Chris Hine is also with us. And for elected officials, we have our very own Chris Hansen. So I don't want to put anybody on spot, but I will. We've, we've started doing this for some of our meetings, especially to just get to know the people here as we, you know, expand our tent. So if you're, this is the first time you're to your HD6 meeting, would you just raise your hand? Any takers? All right, welcome. Welcome. Hopefully we can get you to keep coming or check out our YouTube page, but thank you for coming. Um, if I haven't come around to say uh, welcome yet, I will, but it's very nice to meet you tonight. Uh, it's what's next on our agenda here. So, so I, I don't want to steal any of uh, Mark's thunder, but he, Mark has some really great announcements about Central Committee and some of our fundraisers that we have coming up. But without much ado, I will uh, bring up Mark. Mark, are you ready to give some updates? Mark would like me to introduce our team. So, I am captain of HT6B, Sean Camacho. Here we also have our co-captain of HT6A, Matthew Ball. He's outside of the crane, but he's definitely waving at you. We have co-captain of HT6B, Sharon Desiretti. Katie Mark, treasurer of HT6A. And Mark Hammond, our treasurer of HT6B. So, I think we can kick off the meeting. And Mark, you're up. Are we broadcasting? Yeah. So I have to look. Yeah. Hello? Hello? What am I looking at? That the light. camera there. That light. Oh, the tripod. I feel like I should go into song or something. Yeah. We will, we will rock you. Thank you. <laughs> um, hello, everybody. Um, as Sean said, I'm the 6B finance chair. I'm also the HD6 between A and B chair. Um, Kate Sneed is in the back, our vice chair. And our, who am I missing? Uh, secretary, Mike Lopez, is in Japan right now. I don't know if he's watching. Sushi Mike? <laughs> um, anyway, and our other captain for 6A, Andrew, is in Maryland helping out his family with his grandmother. So he will be back for the next meeting. Um, all right, so I have several things to go over. Um, first
First of all, let me see a show of hands for how many people are Century Club members. Mm. Could be better. <laughs> you know, they don't, they don't tell me anything other than use Jewish guilt. <laughs> and I am good at that. I learned it from my father. Um, a gal like that one. <laughs> um, if you're not a Century Club member, please join Century Club. This is our largest fundraiser for the Denver Democratic Party. You can join as low as $10 a month, or if you're really ambitious, you can join as much as $1,000 a year, um, or $90 a month. What was that? Or more. No, we only have up to a thousand, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm sure we could figure that out. So. Um, so if you are interested in joining Century Club, um, you can fill out one of these BREs. Um, and I will collect those at the end of the meeting and you just put your credit card in what uh, donation level you would like to be at. Um, and I will happily put those into our system tomorrow when I'm at the office. Um, all right, next begging for dollars is, <laughs> is HD6, our house district. Well, not everybody. Shannon, you're not in six, are you? You're in six? Chris, are you in six? I'm in five. Okay. Um, so, um, we need to raise money for our house district. We had a lot of money last year and we spent a lot of it on the election. And we need to get our funds back up. Um, luckily, we've already paid our uh, Denver Dems dues, which was $1,500. Um, we paid for this church up till, I believe, October, so we're good with that. Um, and we paid for our permit, for our picnic this summer. Um, so we're good as far as that, but we need to raise approximately $4,000 um, in the next six months. So one of the things you can do, I'm giving you an option this time. If you're not coming to our fundraiser, which is a week from this Sunday at Reavers over on old South Gaylord, then please make a donation tonight and put it in the BRE envelope. I am happy to accept $5, $10, $20, $100. Uh, you can do it on credit card, on check, or cash, whatever works. Um, so as far as our fundraiser, we need to sell 40 tickets. Um, in order for us to cover um, basically what I promised Reavers um, a month ago. So tickets are $20 per person. Um, there are flyers on everybody's table. Um, it tells you how to pay for your ticket or you can do a BRE tonight and I will collect those and put those in tomorrow when I'm at the <coughs> office. Um, so the fundraiser um, is what we call our spring fundraiser. Um, we, we charge $20 a ticket so that we can get going. Um, and we will supply, or Reavers will supply, the finger foods um, at the party. If you want more food or a main dish or whatever, then you're on your own. And it's a cash bar, so you are responsible for whatever you're drinking. And the other exciting thing is it's going to be a silent auction. Silent auctions can be a lot of fun. Um, if you get a lot of people to attend and they start outbidding each other, which I love, and we have plants. Um, some of you will know what that means, and I don't mean like a coleus. Um, so it gets the bidding up 
<laughs> Although I think Janine outbids everybody usually. <laughs> um, and bids on her own <laughs> donations. Um, so I'm not going to tell you everything that's at the silent auction this year. But I think there are some very cool things. One of the things that you can bid on um, is dinner for two at the home of Phil Weiser and Heidi Walt, his wife. It'll be a Shabbat dinner on Friday night. If you don't know what a Shabbat dinner is, you should definitely bid because Phil and Heidi do a really awesome dinner on Friday nights. I have been there too many times to count. Um, so that is very exciting. I've had a couple of people tell me I'm outbidding anybody. I don't care what it goes to. Great, I like to hear that. Um, some of the other things, um, we're going to have a basket, a chocolate basket from Stargazer's Chocolate, which is right next door. They have really good chocolate. Um, God, my mind is blank. So, um, she will take two people to lunch if you bid on that item. Uh, Senator Hansen is going to do two, take two people for lunch and give them a tour of the Capitol. Um, so that's not to be missed. Um, let's see, what else do I have? Uh, oh, we have a gift basket with four different $25 gift cards to different restaurants that's been donated. Um, we have a gift certificate for tattered cover. Um, so that should be a good item. Uh, let's see, we have a gift basket um, with, I don't, know I don't know exactly what's in it, they're going to surprise me, but it's from Victoria and Mike Lopez, and knowing Victoria, it will be a very nice gift basket. Uh, Jean Richards is donating, she hand paints greeting cards, they are absolutely gorgeous. Um, she's donating a set of those. Um, <coughs> we have not heard back from Senator Rodriguez yet, am I right, Kate? Right. Oh, Katie's doing yeah. that. Okay. Um, and there will be other things. Uh, we're looking to have about 20 silent auction items. So, I guess Avon's here. Um, please, buy a ticket and come to the party. Um, it would be great to see you there. It's from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock that day. Um, and then our next fundraising event is going to be our uh, summer picnic out at Lowry's uh, Great Lawn Park in Lowry. That's July 22nd. Anybody? Yeah, July 22nd at Great Lawn Park. And then we will also have a wine and cheese fundraiser um, in the fall. So um, I look forward to seeing many of you there. Um, all right, last. Hello? Last thing I have. Two things. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, several people for bringing food tonight. Um, we don't want you to come to our meetings and say you left hungry. So uh, thank you to Janine Ransom for the chili. And Gail Marcus for the delicious kugel. And who am I forgetting? I'm forgetting somebody. Karen Sazaretti. I'm so used to Karen not being here lately, I could bite your back. Um, Karen did the very big salad, and then I did all the desserts because I love to do desserts. Um, so, if you are willing to do food for one of our future meetings, please come see me because the sign-up sheet from February, I've gone through almost everybody. I have a couple of people for next month, and we need to replenish that list. Or you will come and starve, and we don't want that. Um, so thank you uh, to them. Last thing I have, um, for those of you who um, are not aware, our state party um, had our reorg on April 1st. 
and then our Obama dinner we put first. Um, so our new state party chair is Shad Marib. Uh, he's from Vail, I believe, or Eagle. Um, he's the new state party chair. Morgan Carroll retired after six years. Um, our Our new first vice chair, I'm never going to get this person's name right, but I'm going to try, from Arapahoe County is Indira Dugirala, I think. She's a wonderful person. She ran unopposed. Shad had two opponents, so it went to a second um, ballot, but Shad won. Um, our second vice chair is Denver's very own Scott Mangino, who is our tech captain for Denver Dems and does a great job. Um, secretary is Josh Troopin. Treasurer is Rosanna Dandi Reyes. Vice chair for party operations is former Denver Democrat vice chair, my first vice chair, when I was a chair, Jared Munger, who I love. Unfortunately, he moved to Fort Morgan. God helped him. Uh, he has Richard Holtorf, so you could feel sorry for him. Um, the vice chair for demographic and cultural outreach is Stephanie Bowman. Vice chair for geographic outreach is Amy Paschal. And the new vice chair for public relations and marketing is also from Denver, and that's Sheena and Cotty. So we have some great people at the state party, um, and it'll be interesting to see how things go in the next few months and where things are at with the state party. So, any questions? Okay, thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna be really brief, but I'm just gonna quickly introduce our next speaker, um, our fantastic and amazing senator. Um, senator Chris Hansen is gonna get up and talk to us. ...to the floor after doing some committee work. So uh, there's kind of that, that saying in golf, you drive for show and putt for dough. Uh, we are now putting at the Capitol. It is, it is on. Uh, we are entering the final four weeks. Uh, of and I often joke we kind of do one thing for the first, you know, 100 days and then an entirely different thing for the last 20. And those of you who have been down at the Capitol, you, you know uh, how it kind of switches gears. We're, we're, I think, solidly in fifth gear now. So a lot of things moving. And what I thought I would do tonight is uh, my first task, which is to talk uh, at some depth about the gun violence prevention bills that we've been working on this session. Uh, what is at or near the governor's desk uh, and will uh, you know, most certainly become law, and then a couple of other efforts that are uh, ongoing and underway. Uh, and I'm involved in, in several pieces of this. So you probably saw a fair amount of media attention on the first four bills. So we had a package that we got put together uh, kind of late January, got those introduced, and they've been moving through the process and are now uh, basically on a final legislative step in, in, or already in the governor's uh, signing queue. And those four bills include uh, the product liability uh, bill, or PLACA, and that is to remove uh, the uh, kind of extraordinary, I think is the right word, product liability protections that Colorado has for firearm manufacturers. Uh, we were one of just a couple of states that had those extra protections we're essentially removing those with those, this bill. Um, the, unfortunately, the federal ones are still particularly strong. Those are, um, <laughs> yeah. She has six of them against her. <laughs> no, uh, Katie uh, helped the speaker manage uh, all, of those, all of those amendments through that process when we passed the original version of the ERPO bill. This is now an expansion to include uh, teachers, mental health professionals, and, and uh, a few other categories of, of licensed professionals in the state that can now file these extreme risk protection orders as part of their job. So if there's a teacher, uh, professor, mental health care professional, counselor, or uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, et cetera, they can actually bring these uh, forward and file those and have those you know, go through the review process uh, with, in front of a judge. And this, I think, uh, provides us another set of tools 
Uh, especially if you think about, say, the, the case of the Aurora Theater shooting, um, where the mental health professional, the counselor for the shooter, uh, if this law would have been in place, maybe it prevented a tragedy. You know? So you know, there's obviously no single bill that is gonna end gun violence or end uh, the situation that we currently face, um, but we think this, this package uh, and you know, continued work uh, will continue to make a, a really strong difference in Colorado. The fourth one, uh, which I was a friend sponsor on, um, along with Tom Sullivan, whose his son, you may recall, was, was murdered in the Aurora Theater shooting, um, is the waiting periods bill. And this creates a minimum of three days waiting period from purchase to possession. Now, sometimes the background checks you know, take longer than that, so it's whichever one is shorter. So if your background check takes five days, it's five days. In, all, in many cases, they can be pretty straightforward and you can get the background check done within 12, 24, 36 hours. So this creates a new uh, bar, a new minimum of 72 hours. Many other states, 10 others jurisdictions have some version of this. Again, a massive amount of uh, epidemiological data and evidence to show how this reduces suicides, domestic violence, uh, deaths, lots of uh, great data on, on the effectiveness of a three-day waiting period. So I'm pleased to report to you that those uh, have been or will be signed shortly. We got those four done. They are in, in the camps. Um, so, you know, I think a really successful year with those four bills. Now again, not a single one of those, uh, not a single bill is gonna solve the problem. But we're really trying to look at the evidence base that's there, working closely with uh, Moms Demand Action, Everytown, Giffords, right? There's national groups that have been looking at this across jurisdictions, across the world to see what works. Um, and obviously we've got constraints uh, with the Supreme Court and with uh, you know, the, the constitutional language and how the Supreme Court is interpreting that, but we're gonna do everything in our power, everything that we can uh, to reduce gun violence. So those four, uh, as I said, are in law or will soon be. Tomorrow morning, uh, I am filing the ghost guns bill. So that will be uh, the next one that's coming. Uh, the ghost guns bill, I'm working with Senator Fields, we'll launch that in the Senate. Um, and the good news is we actually have some bipartisan support on this. Um, it, nobody live tweet this, but tomorrow morning, uh. we're gonna have, <laughs> uh, tomorrow morning there's gonna be several prominent Republicans, none of whom serve in the Capitol, uh, who are gonna come out in support of this bill. So I'll let you guess who that is because it's not a big bench, folks. There's not that many people uh, that fit in that category. <laughs> so um, there's going to be, I think, some pretty high-profile Republican names that will join on this bill, uh, and those will be announced tomorrow morning. And uh, this, I think, is going to create a very different dynamic. I am not expecting a single Republican vote on any of these bills. Uh, that is probably not going to happen. As you may have heard, the Republican reorg elected Dave Williams as their new party chair. Uh, I kid you not, he is literally calling into the House chamber four or five times a day with orders. And it's essentially set up this dynamic of you do what I say or, and then you fill in the blank. And it has created a really unhealthy climate in the House from what I can tell. Um, and I'm find myself thanking my lucky stars I'm in the Senate day after day. Uh, but that, unfortunately, is the situation. So I'm not expecting a single Republican vote, um, but there'll be some high-profile Republicans who will be a part of that bill. And I think this is, it's urgent and poignant because the shooting at East, where the two deans were shot by the young man who was on probation because of a ghost gun violation. So there's a direct tie ghost gun access, particularly for high school youth and for uh, folks uh, being able to access guns, you know, through, through those illegal means, or will hopefully, you know, soon be illegal. The, the second example is the Club Q shooting, which looks like there's strong evidence that that was a ghost gun that was involved in that terrible tragedy. And we can come up with hundreds and hundreds of examples from across the country where this is one of the key ways that there's access 
Um, you know, we did it, I worked on a safe storage bill a couple of years ago, that's the other way that unfortunately high school kids are getting guns, is they take it from mom and dad who didn't store it properly. We know that's a problem. And again, this, you know, the safe storage bill did not end that problem in the state, but it gives us an enforcement mechanism. It gives us a clear way for law enforcement and for DAs to, to steadily improve uh, that situation. So we think that the, you know, the data again is showing that the combination of making ghost guns illegal and pushing hard on safe storage both have a significant impact on improving safety. And really excited to get that done. The other one uh, that we, uh, you know, I was hoping to hear from Rep Epps tonight, uh, I know she introduced the assault weapons ban. Yes. That is still, uh, I, I believe, pending hearing in the House. And so I don't know exactly what the dynamic is on that bill as far as you know, when it's going to be heard. Uh, but that has been filed. So those are the six. Those are the six that are in motion at the Capitol. Uh, as I said, four done. Ghost guns feeling like we're going to be able to move that quickly through the process. Uh, with some bipartisan support from outside the building. And then the sixth is the assault weapons ban that's still pending here. So that is uh, hopefully a, a comprehensive update of what has happened on, on gun violence prevention at the Capitol. Um, I'm going to pause there, see if any questions have come up about those six bills. Yes? Uh, on the red flag one, uh, is there any more mechanism to, to force the sheriffs to enforce it? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, so I'm trying to remember the particulars on that one. Uh, I don't believe there's any additional language in the bill. Uh, the AG believes that there is adequate uh, uh, <coughs> mechanism, or, or it's, I shouldn't say adequate, I should say there is a mechanism where that, uh, that uh, conversation can be had. Um, but I don't have a comprehensive answer for you on that, and I wouldn't want to speak for the AG on that. Yeah, yeah Chris. I just say ghost guns are already illegal in the city of Denver. City Council outlawed them in 2022. Yeah, uh, which is great, but I, I think we have to be clear-eyed about the limitations of city by city. Absolutely. And we have to be clear-eyed about the limitations of state by state. Right. right? I mean, how hard is it to get to Cheyenne? Right. And you know what you can do in Cheyenne with weapons. Uh, anything you like. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd want to be just... Yeah. Clear out about that. I'm I'm so happy we have that in Denver, but um, you know the the state level action I think um, is going to be a, make a make a big difference on this. Yeah, Karen. With the um, the um, EPS assault weapons ban bill that hasn't been or ha has been introduced. Yeah, it has been it filed. Hasn't had its first reading. But it hasn't been scheduled for its first committee hearing. It is, hasn't is, been scheduled. Yeah, I, I checked it on. I checked it. You know, just to make sure I had the latest. And Do you know if, if, the it set, if, there, if it has any co-sponsors in the Senate that are going to, like, once it gets through the House, are going to bring it up in the Senate? Oh, I, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I am very supportive of it, just to be very clear with everyone. I, I would love to have a chance to vote for that bill. Um, but I don't know if, if they're, what, who is it? Rhonda Fields. Fields, okay, thank you. All right, so she signed on already. Thanks. So what could we do to help with, I'm hoping the ghost guns is going to pass, and I'm hoping the assault weapons one is going to pass. The other ones have passed, but what could we do to help those other ones pass if we wanted to do something? Uh, well, uh, I would definitely email our governor. That was my question. <laughs> definitely send him a little note. Katie. Are there bills that you're particularly concerned that the governor might, the governor might not be as keen on? As excited about? As excited uh, about? Perhaps the assault weapons ban? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we, we have confirmed his support of the ghost gun bill, and the other four will be signed. Right. Um, but yeah, the, my understanding is he is not supportive of the current version of the assault weapons ban. Because of I have stopped psychoanalyzing our governor. <laughs> I decided that um, I did an engineering degree and I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> yes. All right, other questions on the gun violence prevention bills? Yeah, Katie. Okay. What would you anticipate seeing next year? Uh, licensing. Various forms of licensing, gun shop licensing, uh, is high on that list. <laughs> So I, I think there's going to be several of those ideas come forward. 
I think there's also some really interesting thinking right now around uh, uh, ammunition. Turns out ammunition is not in the Constitution, just to remind <laughs> everyone. It gives us quite a bit uh, of additional optionality when it comes to ammunition. So I know those, I, I've been in a couple conversations already about, about those bills uh, you know, getting worked on over the summer. And so those are a couple areas where I would expect action in the 2024 20, session. Yeah. All right, is that a good place yes. to pause on gun violence prevention? All right, thank you everyone for uh, your attention on that. I was just gonna follow up uh, with three other quick uh, ending thoughts here on, on my update. Uh, we've got a big conversation happening right now around property tax. That is the next round of the work that I was heavily involved in the last two sessions, uh, trying to use uh, the property tax mechanism to, to reduce the, the regressivity of our tax code while making sure that we fund our local services, schools, library districts, et cetera. So tough conversation. Um, there is what I would describe as a bit of a hostage situation. Um, if you're a right-wing donor in the state of Colorado, where is the only success that you've had in the last three cycles? Trivia question. Across the board tax cuts. That's exactly it. Uh, unfortunately, the voters did it again this last uh, time around. Another income tax cut. And that is really the focus right now for the right-leaning donors in the state. And we're seeing another version of that coming on property tax. Um, could have devastating impact. Um, for those of you that are familiar with California and Prop 13, there are some things that are coming forward that look a lot like Prop 13. Um, that would be a disaster for Colorado for a bunch of reasons, uh, which we can get into as that, as that debate develops. Um, also pleased to report uh, kind of my biggest bill of the session um, out of the gate was a greenhouse gas emissions bill, uh, getting some very, um, well, you know, clear targets in place from now until 2050 and with all with the goal of getting to net zero by 2050. Uh, we've, I think, worked out the final large pieces of that negotiation. The governor now appears ready to support and should be able to get that to his desk uh, over the next couple of weeks. So I'll get that off the Senate floor tomorrow. Uh, I'm really excited to, to see that one cross the finish line. And the last piece um, is uh, something you may have seen in the papers, uh, which is the land use bill uh, that is causing a huge amount of, of great discussion. And I mean that very sincerely. This is an overdue discussion in many ways. Uh, these are tough issues. Uh, it affects you know, Denver in different ways. It affects the state in different ways, the proposals that are in that bill. I would love to hear from you. I'm expecting, I got a bit of a roadmap from uh, Dominic Moreno, who's the, who's the main sponsor of kind of where he sees some of the amendments going, but I'd love to hear from you on the pros and cons of that bill. Um, you know, it, it just, it affects different parts of the city in different ways. Uh, there are some by right provisions around ADUs, duplexes, triplexes, and quads that are in that bill right now. Uh, some of the parts of it that I, I really love are the high density on the, on the corridors, which is something I, I uh, have talked a lot about lately of, of how I think Denver's gonna be successful if we go down that path. So some really great concepts in that bill, um, but would love to hear from you. And you know, if next time you're at your next RNO or, or neighborhood meeting, um, you know, I'm really gonna be doing my best to reach out to the district and, and make sure I check in with folks on you know, the pros and cons of a very complicated bill that's it's gonna uh, have a lot of you know, devil in the detail, as they say. So I'd love to hear from everybody on that land use bill. That will be moving over the next couple of weeks. So, all right, I will leave it there. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Are you gonna do SB 30 one day as a uh, That is a wonderful question. So I am, uh, the answer is yes. I've been a little distracted lately. <laughs> I wonder why. So thank you for the reminder. I'm doing my stellar student day in a couple of weeks. Uh, more to come on Senate District 31 day at the Capitol. All right. Thanks, everybody. So that coincidentally is a really good segue because I forgot to mention this earlier, and I think it's really important. So Mark talks a lot about how we need to raise money. And we raise money for one very specific purpose. Not for audio video equipment, because we can use an upgrade there, obviously. <laughs> it is for get out the vote. And it's really to support candidates. And tonight we have two candidates, but we've also had a candidate for mayor. 
And we've had you know, 17 people across the city that have put their lives on hold, their families on hold, and went out and did something that's really, really hard. Running for office and putting yourself out there. And you know, statistically, you're not gonna be successful doing that, but it doesn't mean it, their sacrifice should be worth any less. And as Democrats, we should thank them for advancing the conversation, giving us choice, and helping us really advance our democracy. And I would like to just say thank you to all the <coughs> candidates in the room. I know it's been very hard on all of you, it's been hard on your supporters, and I'd just like to say thank you. Um, House of Six. So with that said, we're not quite done yet. We have two candidates. Um, we do have a runoff election um, in City Council District 10. So for a lot of the folks here in six, uh, you're either in five or you're in House District 10. How, uh, City Council District 5, uh, our current rep, um, Amanda Sawyer. Amanda Sawyer, thank you. I was <laughs> uh, has won re-election, but for uh, District 10, we have Shannon Hoffman and Chris Hines. So we've invited them here today to talk and give one last pitch to voters of House District 6. So the way this is going to work is each candidate is going to get through uh, five minutes as an opening statement, and then we have some questions, and the questions will be open to you as well to ask um, any question you'd like about the city or their vision for the city. Um, this is really that last opportunity before, when's the, when's the runoff? June? June 6th. June 6th. Um, so by alphabetical order, I'm gonna call up Chris Hines first. Did you have to do the alphabet in your head? I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's like first name, last name, but it is either way. <laughs> Hey Chris, before you start, can you can you talk about the boundary for uh, City Council District 10? Uh, sure. Um, so Council District 10, do I need to get closer? A little the, bit closer would okay. help you, just a smidge. <laughs> Audio visual. Hopefully, I'm still in the in the frame. Okay. Uh, so Council District 10 includes uh, uh, downtown from the river to 20th. Uh, effectively the railroad tracks to, uh, to City Hall. It also includes Golden Triangle, um, uh, City Park West, South City Park, Congress Park, Cheeseman Park, and, um, and the northern portion of, uh, of Capitol Hill, uh, and Uptown, sorry, uh, which is where I, where I lived when I was elected. Um, but so the, uh, unfortunately Capitol Hill was not, uh, is this you're, part No, 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 you're good. Okay. Uh, Capitol Hill was not, uh, I was not able to remain whole. We either had to split Cap Hill or Bel Verde. And Cap Hill was inside the inverted L and predominantly white. And Bel Verde was outside the inverted L and predominantly uh, uh, minority. So um, we decided to split Cap Hill. Okay, ready? Yep. That, now your five minutes starts. Okay. Uh, my name is Chris Hines. I serve on Denver City Council representing District 10. Um, I like to call it Denver's Perfect 10. Um, I am the first elected official in Denver's history, uh, local, state, or federal, who uses a wheelchair for mobility, and the first who identifies as a member of the disability community. So I want to thank uh, the, the, the voters in uh, effectively HD6A um, for, uh, for choosing me in 2019, and, uh, and now we have an op uh, opportunity to choose me again. Um, I am a lifelong Democrat, even though I grew up in rural East Texas. Um, I joined the... Um, uh, I was the precinct committee person, or PO now as it's called, but back in my day it was a PCP <laughs> um, uh, uh, in precinct 201, which is in Uptown, from 2012 to when I was elected. Um, I was also on the DPOD Central Committee and the CDP State Central Committee. So I, um, I've been a strong Democrat for, uh, for many years. Um, so, um, you know, the first term, uh, had a bit of curveballs. Um, I know I talked a lot about um, you know, answering questions about what I wanted to do as a candidate in 2019, and um, uh, we had this like global pandemic um, <laughs> that, that really impacted our, um, our ability to, uh, to even think about um, much else besides, uh, besides COVID. Um, so I talked a lot about making sure that we all had access, as in, uh, people asked me if I could be anything more than just the disability candidate, and I said, of course, I need access, but we all need access to housing, transportation, and representation. And so, um, you know, people felt like they weren't represented in District 10 by the, by the person before, and, um, uh, and I'd like to think that I've been uh, more representative uh, of, of District 10. So, um, 
Uh, but COVID uh, passed, you know, created a lot of curveballs balls for us. We also had um, uh, George Floyd, um, that uh, for for many people um, recentered the thoughts on um, uh, on on a very important topic for for many others. Um, this has been a, a topic that's been uh, front and center for 400 years. Um, so, uh, so we've got the, the community to think once again about um, uh, police, police violence, um, and, uh, and equality and equity for, uh, for everyone. And, um, and of course, we have also had growing inequality and, uh, and affordability in our city. Um, but you know, while I wasn't able to, uh, to focus a lot on the things that, uh, that I really wanted to accomplish uh, that I talked about on my campaign trail, um, we got a lot done. Um, we raised the minimum wage. Uh, now we have the highest minimum wage in the state of Colorado, the city of Denver does, and one of the highest minimum wages in the country. Um, the, uh, the minimum wage increase in 2022 affected more than one in nine Denverites. Did you know that 100,000 Denverites live on SNAP? Or, you know, one in three Denverites get some sort of financial assistance uh, from our Denver Human Services. Uh, so, uh, so that's my that my proudest single vote that I that I cast so far in the term. Um, but we also um, uh, we also passed uh, a wage theft bill. We also passed um, a mandatory um, eviction uh, defense uh, for free uh, for uh, for many uh, rent renters that. Uh, um, that felt that they were, um, or that if they were in the eviction process, they could get free representation uh, from the city, um, or uh, you know, uh, contract that the city worked with. And um, uh, we also passed a, in, in addition to a tenant's bill of rights, um, we passed a mandatory. Oh my goodness, um, uh, we we passed a, a mandatory rental registry because we have a lot of landlords, including in District 10, who. Um, our slumlords, and uh, they have exposed electrical wires, and I'm sorry for the mom and pop landlords that are also having to comply to this registry, but, um, but there are so many slumlords, um, including inside the inverted L, in the have neighborhoods that are, that are in District 10. Um, so I, um, I, I'd like to come back uh, to, um, uh, to return to District 10 to uh, continue the work on uh, many of the reforms that I've, I've worked on in the past four years, but also to refocus on uh, on the things that I had talked about when I um, originally ran for District 10 uh, just a few years ago. So I'm Chris Hines. The website is chrisfordenver.com, and I'd love to have your vote. Thank you. Shannon, would you like to come and give your five minutes? Since Chris had about a minute or so to talk about your district, if you'd like to give your thoughts on the district or the boundaries or kind of how you see it, you're welcome to do that as well. Sure, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Shannon Hoffman. Uh, yeah, and would love to give some thoughts about um, the boundaries and the redistricting process. I was really involved in that process as a community member and also as a community advocate um, with a program of started up called How Shit Gets Done in Denver. And so um, we did have some opportunities to make some different choices around our maps. Um, one is that you know our, our map at the city level is made by council members. And so um, I, I think that we really need to consider ways that we can have community members and more um, objective people involved in that process. Because one of the things this current council did was um, create a process by which council, current sitting council members could not be drawn out of their districts. Um, so I do think that we need to take a look at our maps. We need to consider perhaps more districts um, so that we don't have to divide up our neighborhoods. Um, so that's a little bit about redistricting and my nerdy interests. Uh, <laughs> So I, and, and that's also a part of the things that I'm interested in and um, why I um, am a candidate for this seat. Um, so I'll just dive into that, is, is around um, co-governance and getting people really involved um, in, in local politics. 
I think where that comes from is that I have been an educator for more than 10 years. I've taught GED, I have worked with um, young people at colleges and universities, mostly students of color and low income students at predominantly white wealthy campuses. I've also worked with um, high school students, um, including undocumented students, um, students that are in college and career success programs. And I recently made a career shift into working with a community development corporation that is building 97 units of affordable housing, a grocery store, a mental health center, business incubator space, on an RTD park and ride site in Montbello. Um, and I worked with them to support them to get to the financial closing of that project. We broke ground late February, early March. And I think it's a model that I would like to see us have in District 10. Um, we definitely have land and spaces where we could do that. One opportune space is the former District 6 police station right on Colfax, um, which is just a couple blocks away from where I live. So um, I, I live in the heart of Cap Hill and I'm a renter in a 100 year old building. Um, I, it's a simple thing, but I bring it up because um, 70% of the people in District 10 are renters, more than 50% of the people in our city are renters. Um, we, are facing, um, we are facing increasing numbers of eviction in our city, and while um, we do have de eviction defense for people who are making 80% of the area median income, we do not have it available for everyone in our city. Um, nor do we have any kind of um, funding for a lot of outreach um, in court and so that folks can know that that, that service is available to them. Um, I know that because I was really involved with No Eviction Without Representation, which was a ballot initiative to try to expand that service to folks in our city that we know um, need it. Uh, another thing that I was really um, a, a but proud to be a part of was a group called Allies to Abolitionists, and it really did come out of um, the George Floyd, the protests of the murder of George Floyd. Um, it was started by my friend Jeff Campbell, who is a playwright and um, started uh, Emancipation Theater Company. So Allies to Abolitionists was about engaging um, specifically white people who were recognizing that we do have significant racial injustice in our country, we've had it for many, many years, um, and that there are things that we can work on um, right here in our city. Um, one of the things that we worked on was um, uh, file, basically a people's audit of the sweeps of unhoused neighbors. Um, and so we filed more than 60 Colorado open records requests. We got about a thousand documents back. We found that when we conduct sweeps, um, that costs the city between five to $20,000. It costs us that um, every single time we conduct a sweep. Uh, there's also just recently an article that came out um, from two uh, medical providers right here in Denver that looked at both Denver, but or looked at Denver as well as other cities. Found that um, as we conduct these sweeps, we are also just um, increasing the likelihood of of early death for folks. Um, and so I think that there are so many ways that we as a city can um, be supporting people. I think the pandemic was an opportunity for us to see how we take care of and how we can, in emergency situations, take care of the most vulnerable among us. And the housing crisis in our city is an emergency situation that we really need to intervene on. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to, um, and to the voters to be in this position, to be in a runoff, um, to have this conversation. Um, and I'm thankful for your questions tonight into the conversation. So this next portion is each candidate is going to get two minutes to answer a question. Oh, sorry. Um, that's okay. <laughs> each, each candidate is going to get two minutes to answer the question. So the first question is two parts. SB 23-213, currently under consideration by the General Assembly, attempts to tackle Colorado's affordable housing crisis by preventing local governments like Denver from banning, among other things, the construction of ADUs, duplexes, triplexes, and townhomes, imposing per unit parking requirements and regulating how many unrelated people can live in the same home. In addition to SB 23-213, uh, attempts to make a number of more minor changes, including opening the door for construction of more manufactured homes, limiting the power of homeowners associations, and more. 
What is your position on SB 23213, fully knowing you're not a legislator, but a city council person, so what is your position? And two, what can you do as a council person in the city and county of Denver to help fill in the gaps and really address our affordable housing crisis? Sure, thank you. Oh, am I, is it on? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I think there are a lot of um, interesting components of this bill. Another piece of it, I had a really good conversation with folks at Queen City Collaborative, which is a um, collaborative, or which is a co-op housing um, house in Capitol Hill, and one of the things they're excited about there is that this will also um, essentially expand group living so that we don't have limits on the number of people that can live in one house, and that increases affordability, um, and something that I definitely think we need. Um, I am not an opponent to um, upzoning and certainly ADUs, triplexes. I think that those are things that we need in our city. Um, it's just that when we consider this bill, um, there, there's another tool that needs to come with it that protects people, which is rent control. Um, and so, you know, when we're thinking about um, how we are going to um, support um, property owners, when we're thinking about how we're going to uh, make make something like upzoning work for developers um, and for folks that are building our housing. I also think we need to consider how we're gonna make it work for the people that live in inside that housing, which is for the rent to be affordable. Um, so a, another big piece of this in terms of what can we do at the city level, um, we also can become the developer of social housing, um, which is where we build the housing that is affordable for people, um, recognizing that we absolutely need it. That's always fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can I just angle it, yes. Angle it, all right. Um, so, uh, so one, one thing that I've learned as an elected official is that it's hard to uh, to take a position on something that you haven't read, um, and I haven't read this. So I'm going to talk to the um, to the talking points as opposed to the the, the details of the bill. Um, uh, so I think uh, you know District 10 is already a very multifamily area of the city, and um, and I think that uh, that, that what I've heard for, about Senate Bill 213 is great. It is something that. Uh, uh, that I'm already uh, accomplishing as best I can in, in District 10, considering we have to get 13 votes, or at least the majority of those 13 votes. Uh, so like in Golden Triangle, uh, we elected to eliminate parking minimums. So now you don't have, uh, as a developer to build housing, you don't have to have any parking at all. Um, and why should you in Golden Triangle have to install parking when uh, more than a third of households in Golden Triangle don't own cars at all? Um, and then, uh, uh, but, uh, Senate Bill 213 in general, I think, has a lot, of, um, a lot of benefits for the city of Denver because of what it does to other cities, like, for example, the city of Lakewood. Um, as, you, uh, as you know, the people in, in the city of Lakewood said no to, uh, to housing development in their city. And so they've lim limited growth, which means as, as the secret is out and people want to move to our, our lovely city uh, and state, um, they, uh, they can't move into Lakewood, and we've got also uh, very restrictive uh, laws in Boulder as well, so Denver is taking the brunt of it. And, uh, and so I can see uh, one of the advantages that I know theoretically of 213 is that uh, it's an equalizer for, uh, for the state and, and specifically for the city of Denver so that we don't have to take all the growth. Sorry. Oh. So, the great majority of candidates in race for the Denver mayor began every answer about public safety, um, stating that they would first step up recruitment of police officers for the city and county of Denver. Do you agree with this statement? And where do you believe the city is falling short with its police department? And how can we fix that? I love this question. <clears throat> uh, so much that it took my voice away. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so I think that our, our public safety system should lead with compassion. Um, you know, when I started, uh, we talked about STAR, it was a pilot, and then we funded the, uh, the full element of STAR, um, and uh, just in January we added another $3.4 million in STAR as one example of uh, community policing. It's um, 
taking a civilian vehicle with a paramedic and a mental health provider and, uh, and having them go to addiction and mental health calls as opposed to having a police officer go to those calls. That said, we need a police department. And, um, and we've, we've had more than 130,000 people move to the city of Denver since 2013. And, uh, and we haven't had an increase in, in force in our police since, uh, since 2013. So, um, uh, so I, I, I do agree that we're, um, we're nearly 200 officers shy of, uh, of being fully staffed. And we hear it again and again and again in, uh, in, in calls from constituents. Uh, from uh, speeding, uh, from speed or uh, street racing, uh, to and those are just simple things. Um, to uh, uh, there was a shooting in my neighborhood, and it took three hours for the police to arrive. Um, so it's it's very important. Um, our city's number one job is public health, safety, and welfare, and uh, and we need to make make sure that we have uh, lead with compassion and have alternatives to the police. But at the end of the day. Uh, if someone is shooting my kid, if I were to have a kid, I'd want the police to respond. So one of the, I think, interesting things about this question in terms of, of increasing um, our police force is that one thing that we're hearing from young people is that there are many young people that don't want to go into police and policing, and that's one of the reasons that we're having a challenge in, um, in continuing to increase our police force. And so as someone who has worked with young people my entire career, I think it's really important that we talk with young people about um, why is this not a career field that you're interested in, um, and, and what is it about the work um, that's happening here that's not something that you want to be a part of. So certainly, I think we need to invest in the things that, um, as I've heard Representative Epps say, keep us healthy, safe, and free. And, um, and STAR is one of those programs, right? It's an alternative responder program. It, um, it increases safety um, when we look at the data, and it's also cheaper. It's usually about um, $600 per response when we send a police officer, and it's about $150 when we send an alternative responder through the STAR program. We also hear from folks um, in Denver Health who say, you know, often a police officer might be called to a situation, and then the police officer themselves actually calls someone from Denver Health because the police officer recognizes that they cannot respond to the situation. Um, and so that is a reason why um, we, we need to have opportunities where we can just directly send the appropriate um, response to a particular situation. So that also includes you know, having a direct line to STAR and also having an opportunity just like the Citizens Oversight Board, which we have for the Office of the Independent Monitor, but having a Citizens Oversight Group for STAR as well so that we can have community control and oversight um, of our safety programs. You'll be first up. Okay. okay. In April 2020, Denver launched Shared Streets Program to give residents more space for outdoor transportation and recreation while social distancing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite overwhelmingly positive feedback, Denver unceremoniously terminated the Shared Streets Program in August 2021 and ripped out the associated block closures, traffic calming features, etc., citing the need for setting the need for, as Colorado Politics described it, a lengthy process for considering permit, permanent alternatives. As a member of Denver City Council, would you do, what would you do to make outdoor transportation and recreation, including walking and biking, more viable, convenient, and safe for Denver residents? Yeah, I, I live a block away from uh, that street that was blocked off. It was really great to be able to easily walk on, on that street. Um, and I also see you know, people that use the street who aren't walking and biking. Um, there are elders who are using um, electric wheelchairs, who are using walkers, who don't have um, sufficient sidewalks in the neighborhood to get around. So they are also using these bike lanes, and they do need to be protected as well. Um, 
you know, I think the, the discourse sometimes around this is sort of like either you're pro bike lane or, or you're not, right? Um, and we all need opportunities to get around our city safely and we need to have um, rigorous public discourse and be able to answer people's questions. So um, I, I think when we see something where, you know, there is a, is a great solution that has been provided and then we hear from some folks that have some concerns about it, we certainly need to listen to those concerns and answer those questions and we need to move towards the things that are better for our environment and are also protecting people in our city. I think we also see this with Colfax BRT. I'm really excited about bus rapid transit, and I also think people that live um, in Congress Park and live in, in the neighborhoods that are adjacent have some really excellent questions about, can we get some information about traffic studies? Can we get some information about parking? And I think that those questions um, should certainly be answered for neighbors, and that doesn't preclude us from doing the things that are better for our planet and for better, are better for people getting around um, outside of their cars. Hello. Okay. I realized. Uh, okay. I realized I didn't directly answer the first question. Yes, we should. Uh, we should uh, put more money into recruitment. Um, why is this? Just try a little more at angles. Hello. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, uh, so it, it's no secret that I'm, I'm very much a fan of uh, of multimodal uh, safety. I am a victim of traffic violence. The reason I'm in a wheelchair today is because. Uh, I was in a traffic crash, and um, uh, and I so I've been a multimodal advocate since before uh, before I even moved to Colorado. Um, as far as the shared streets, um, it's no secret you can check Twitter. Um, I was very vocal about creating the shared streets program before it even was implemented. There's no uh, secret about why 11th and 16th Avenues were the first two shared streets in the city. Uh, they were because of my advocacy. Um, uh, they, uh, they stayed for longer than the mayor wanted them to uh, because I got a, a letter signed unanimously by every city council member asking them uh, to stay and they went away and I did not know about it. So, um, so we were not consulted at all in city council of, of when they would be removed, but, uh, but yes, I'm very much a fan of multimodal um, access. Uh, the reason uh, Cheeseman Park, uh, the circle is open to the people or closed to cars, whichever you would prefer, uh, is because of my advocacy. Um, the uh, banning between 14th and Colfax, immediately in front of uh, City Hall, that is permanently closed to cars, and that is also a result of my advocacy. And so I'm very interested in uh, the 5280 trail, a 5.280 mile pedestrian and cyclist priority route around the city center, and um, a citywide shared streets network so that everyone has the freedom to get from A to B safely, no matter how they choose to get there. All right, so this is the last question, and it's, it's partially my question. Uh, uh, so the city resoundingly voted no on 2-0, and uh, what I'm really talking about on 2-0, and uh, what I'm really talking about is the big green elephant in the room, also known as the Park Hill Golf Course, What's next? What role does the city have in framing that conversation? What should happen next to that property? And what can we expect from you in city council in this next session? So, holy cow, um, we've got great tech here. Uh, so <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's no secret. Uh, my position on 2.0 and on Park Hill Golf Course. So um, the city should have bought it. Uh, years ago, but um, but that, but here we are. Um, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, uh, but I did vote to refer 2-0 to the ballot to the people, and the people resoundingly said no. And that's uh, that is uh, that's why we refer things to the people. Um, what should we do next? Um, uh, apparently, so this is this is the conversation that that we heard. So we as uh, legislators have to listen. We have to listen to as many different sides as possible, and um, and we heard very loud and clear from two different camps, the city attorney's office and the uh, Save Open Spaces uh, group, and both have attorneys. Um, one said it must be a golf course or golf-related activities, and the other said it can be open space. Um, I'm not an attorney. I can't uh, figure out what, what the right answer is. 
Um, but, uh, but by referring it to the ballot, we also were able to engage the judicial branch. Uh, those are uh, attorneys and the judges are, uh, are, are gonna help us make that uh, determination on whether it can be a golf course. November and a uh, big reason is because I'm embedded in community with my neighbors and I was listening to my neighbors who said that this is a bad deal from this developer this does not give us what we want and need which is truly affordable housing and access to green space so West Side made an offer and we as the city said as community said no this offer is not good enough for us and so I do think that it is the role of city council members to help with those negotiation processes, but their role is not to defend developers, it's to defend community, which says, when we're talking about affordable housing, we mean truly affordable housing that's for people that make $25,000 a year. When we're talking about green space, we're not talking about a retention fund. We're talking about a space that we can walk around in, right? Um, so I think that that is the conversation that city council members can help lead. Um, I also am not an attorney, but I have read the conservation easement and it does state that a, a golf course is not the only use that can happen there. It can be an open space, it can be a ball field, um, and you can read it right there um, in the conservation easement to determine um, what we can do with that space. So we, before we open this up for questions from the audience, we do have two questions from cyberspace. So for those of you who thought people weren't actually watching our YouTube channel, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, so the first question is for you, Shannon. Earlier you said how much would it cost, or earlier you made a comment about the city being a developer and we could build our own housing. Uh, I think that was in response to the first question. Right. How much do you, would it cost for the city to build social housing and what would, what would you cut in the current budget to make room for that? Well, a couple things here. Um, I certainly think to, in order to do this that we likely would need a bond measure um, because it's, it's extremely expensive to, to build housing. But the great thing about social housing is that people don't pay more than 30% of their income, which means um, that you have a mix of people from socioeconomic backgrounds and that you are also bringing in money so that you can begin to pay down those loans, just as you would um, in, a, in a private development. Um, the other piece here that we would need some funding for that is a little bit different um, would be apartment acquisitions, which we see that bill going through um, at the state level right now. It would allow municipalities to purchase apartment buildings and then keep them affordable. Um, so, those would be the ways that we would do it. Uh, I don't necessarily think that we would um, take from our budget, but I do think that we need an assessment of our housing office and where we are currently putting money. We're putting a lot of money into emergency shelters that we could be putting into more um, permanent housing solutions for folks. It was, it was, the question was directed to Shannon. So we do have a question directed to Chris, so here's your opportunity, Chris. So a uh, question from online was, uh, Shannon said she was for rent control. Chris, what is your position? Uh, can the city, should the city do rent control? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so uh, uh, this is another example of, um, uh, you know, not the devil's in the details, and I wanna make sure what the policy is. Um, but, uh, but in general, I'm, I'm in favor of rent stabilization or rent control, whatever you want to call it. Um, the, uh, you know, our, our uh, affordability continues to go up and it, and it makes sense that, um, uh, that we have some guardrails uh, around uh, a, a rent and affordability. So, uh, so it's definitely, uh, it's, uh, if you received some of my mailers, um, I did uh, talk about that in the, in the mailer. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it is important for us to make sure that we have guardrails as, as our city continues to be fully market driven, um, we see that, uh, uh, that, that it continues to make us uh, more and more unaffordable. Um, as, and I haven't even gone through a minute. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Um, so, uh, so I do want to, I, I do want to address the other question though. Um, 
right now state law, so maybe 213 will, will uh, fix it, but right now state law doesn't allow uh, any municipalities in Colorado to, uh, to uh, manage um, housing. Uh, so we have, um, we have Denver Housing Authority uh, that can manage housing, but the city cannot manage, directly manage any housing because of state law. So, um, uh, so if we were to do any sort of housing initiative, then we would have to, we would rely on, on state law. Um, a lot of the, the budget that we have from our housing stability um, uh, organization, our department, is, uh, is really more focused towards uh, purchasing hotels and motels, uh, temporary rental and utility assistance, um, and, uh, and making sure that people, if they're um, at risk of, of losing their housing, uh, that, uh, that they can remain in their homes. But uh, yes, we are spending money on shelters. Uh, we're also spending money on, um, on safe outdoor spaces and other congregate living. Jane, would you like to respond? You're welcome to respond or we can open questions up. Sure. One minute for response. So I, I, there is some, I think, disagreement about whether or not we can have a social housing developer at, at, at the city level. Um, we do have an attorney that advises um, all of our policy. Um, he has also been an advisor to folks at the state level. He believes that it is possible. Also in Prop 123, um, there's money there that can go directly to the city um, to, to build housing. Essentially, what this is recognizing is that yes, we do have DHA, but that's primarily funded by um, federal funding and we haven't gotten significant federal funding in years to build public housing. And so in order to resolve this issue, we need to imagine beyond our circumstances. So even if we are hearing from folks, it is not possible. We have to imagine beyond what is being told to us is possible right now for the reality that we need to build. Now the fun part, does anyone in the audience have questions they'd like to ask? Skip, I saw your hand first, then Kathy. Sure, okay. Um, my understanding is that you guys differ on one specific issue, which is on on housing for people who are living in urban tent camps, and in terms of how to deal with that. So some of us may be here, but a lot of people would like to just sweep them all away, literally, and a lot of them, like myself, would like to go in and help them as much as possible and try to help them find housing. So where are you on that? Because the biggest problem I see is, is that we, we are putting people in jail and we are doing other things and we are sweep, trying to sweep the problem away and it's not going away. So, so for the benefit of those watching online, the question is, and forgive me if I butcher it, is what is your position on homeless camps? Homeless okay. camps. Homeless camps. And what do you intend to do about them? Yeah, and also the question was, uh, the question included um, that this was the one difference that we had. Um, so I, I would disagree with that. I think the biggest difference between uh, the two of us is that I believe there should be a police department and she does not. She believes that we should abolish the police department. Uh, but back to the question itself, um, I, you know, we, uh, we spend a lot of time and effort and energy um, making sure that we have alternatives to unsanctioned encampments. Um, I, the first two safe outdoor spaces were in District 10. Um, I got up more than a thousand emails in opposition to the safe outdoor spaces that were, uh, that were proposed. And, uh, and I, once, they, um, once they left, uh, people, the only response that we got was, when can we get more safe outdoor spaces? So uh, in District 10, so uh, we're we're very interested. I'm personally very interested in making sure that we have alternatives uh, to unsanctioned encampments. We should make sure that people have uh, have all the options, uh, including shelters, um, including safe outdoor spaces, tiny home villages, and um, uh, safe parking spaces. And by the way, I'm the sponsor of a bill that will be happening. Uh, it will it'll come to a vote before July. Uh, that will make those uh, permanent safe outdoor spaces, safe parking spaces, and, and uh, uh, tiny home villages. So it's temporary managed communities, and I'm the prime sponsor along with Robin Kanich. Just as an example of uh, my interest and commitment to 
uh, defining ways to move people through the spectrum of, of houselessness uh, into permanent housing. Safe outdoor spaces is one example. We've had 520 residents, 180 of them have found permanent housing. So it is, uh, we're, we're not just making sure that we're pushing people from block to block. We are, um, we are investing in solutions that uh, it takes time because we're the government, but we're making it happen. So first of all, at every um, public opportunity, Councilman Hines does like to point out that I am an abolitionist and I um, proudly affirm that. Um, I also am the granddaughter of a coal miner, so I also, and I'm someone that wants us to turn away from using fossil fuel energy, and I recognize that when you go to do something like that, um, you don't do that, um, say that on Thursday, and do it on Friday. You have to build an entire system that, um, that shifts how we operate that energy, but that's not the question, so just saying that though so that we can have an opportunity to talk about it later. Um, I am not a proponent of sweeps, as I you know, mentioned at the beginning. I think it's a, a waste of money, and also, as we are hearing now from medical professionals, it literally kills people. Um, and so what we need to be doing is reallocating those resources into um, what houses people and keeps people um, safe and healthy. Yesterday, um, I was with residents from the Aloft Hotel, which is the last um, COVID protection um, hotel in the city. It's for people who are 60, immunocompromised, and have disabilities. Those folks were promised that they would get housing, and they have not gotten it, and the majority of them are being told that now they will get a bus ride over to the Denver Rescue Mission. These are the most vulnerable people in our community, and um, we are just sweeping them away. Um, what they are asking for, which is actually cheaper than safe outdoor spaces and more effective, is master leasing, which is recognizing that we have empty apartment units in our city, and the city could be the master leasor um, to these tenants. Many folks have jobs. I met people who are have jobs, are in school, um, and simply need a more affordable place to live, um, and that is the more compassionate, but also more economically effective thing for us to be doing. All right. Recognizing that we're getting a little late in time, uh, one last question. I, Kathleen, is your question you'd like? Yeah, so some of us are not police, but they are So the question was, given Denver's strong mayor system, how can council co-govern with the soon to be elected mayor, whoever that is on, on June 6th? So I think you started off last time. Uh, one minute. Sure. Yeah. I am really hopeful that we can get a very progressive um, council and, 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 and pushing for that um, across our city. We've already had two people um, make it through that have been endorsed by the Working Families Party, um, Serena Gonzalez Gutierrez and Sarah Parity. Um, I also have been endorsed by Working Families Party and so I'm hopeful that we can have a progressive council that can be a, a check on the system. I also think that we need council members that council members that recognize their power, right? Which is to make laws, change laws, and to amend the budget. Um, and sometimes that means that you are in opposition to the mayor. It also means that you have to um, work with your council colleagues sometimes when you don't agree with them. Some of them might be more in alignment with the mayor. Um, but, but that's the job of council. Also, we can refer things to the ballot as council members to begin to change the charter and to begin to um, um, decentralize um, the strong mayor system. Thank you. Um, I too hope that we have a progressive council. I've been endorsed by the Progressive Democrats of America. And, um, and I think that uh, we've passed quite a few progressive uh, com progressive changes as far as the check to the the mayor um, that's absolutely uh, this is the mayor's town uh, as you as you say but uh, but it is also very important 
that we can check the mayor. When we voted eight to five to kick out private prisons uh, from, the, from the city of Denver, the mayor's office was so flabbergasted they had no response. They had no idea what to do because the mayor was so used to getting his way and just getting a rubber stamp from council. So this council has been, uh, has been uh, slowly chipping away by, uh, as an example, referring things to the ballot, like um, uh, we should be able to vote to confirm, city council should vote to confirm mayoral appointees that are, that are mentioned in the charter. We referred that to the, uh, to the people and the people said yes. Uh, so I agree, great strategy, that's what we've been doing. Thank you. And 30 seconds for closing. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Give me no time. Sorry. sorry. Uh, uh, uh. Wait for it. I'm sorry. Go. <laughs> thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for being strong Democrats. Um, it was a beautiful day uh, today. I'm imagining that it's a beautiful evening and, uh, and you're here listening to us. So thank you so much. Um, I uh, have served four years on council. I would love to serve another four years. You can go to ChrisForDenver.com. Uh, to learn more or to donate. I'm Chris Hines, please uh, vote for me. Thank you. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak tonight and thank you for the affirmation through, through this vote with the runoff that we do have more, um, pro a more progressive uh, way that we need to move in our city. Um, my name is Shannon Hoffman. Our website is shannon-hoffman.com. This is a people-powered and heart-centered campaign, and we'd love for y'all to be involved in it. The runoff election is on June 6th, and I would love to earn your vote. Okay, thank you to Shannon and Chris. Uh, Mark, I believe, has uh, an announcement. Yeah, for those of you who um, are curious, May 2nd is our next meeting, first uh, Tuesday in May, and I have confirmation that both mayoral candidates are going to be here in person, so do not miss our May 2nd meeting. Uh, and if anybody is interested in going out and socializing after this, please uh, come up and talk to us. Thank you so much for coming, and we will see you next month. Buy your tickets to the Reavers fundraiser, please. And buy tickets to the Reavers. Thank you.